Um, so one of the things I used to do before teaching was talk about plastic pollution for all different types of different programs. So I took like second grade classes and talked to them about how they can make a change, you know, cutting off those uh, six pack rings. And then I used to actually talk to adults about it, making bigger change about installing recycling programs and those sorts of things. So this is one of the presentations I used to give with the nonprofit when I was, I think it was a junior in college, so to give you an idea of what you would Seniors or no? What do you guys? Sophomores? Yeah. Sophomores. So in two years, what you might be doing in college. So um, the nonprofit I worked with was Five Gyres. They pretty much go around to these big bodies of water and they check them out and see how much pollution is there. And the reason that I really got into it is something that you guys can relate really well to. So how many of you go to the Jersey Shore? Yeah. I used to go to Seaside Park. Then we go to Seaside Park. Mm -hmm. South Seaside Park. South Side Park. Anyway, so this is my dad and I in the Jersey Shore, and I loved it. I fell in love with the beach, the clean white sand, and I thought it was like the most beautiful thing. And it wasn't until I really was inspired to go into marine biology that I learned that the things that I loved about the Jersey Shore were actually kind of um, under attack from things like plastic pollution. One of my favorite things to do was actually find sea glass. How many of you guys have found like sea glass on the beach? Any of those like baby blue colored ones? So I really didn't like put that together that that, pla that was actually glass coming from bottles being thrown in the ocean. It actually like has this really negative connotation to it. And if you actually look around, there's a lot of other trash on the beach. So I went back to the beach where I grew up and my brother and I did like, I'd say a block walk, which is as much when you walk in the beach. And this is just a picture of all the trash that we picked up from this place that we identified as like our home and our vacation spot that we loved. So it was kind of like, man, if you found all this stuff on your yard, would you be like mad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd be pretty mad at someone. So that's the feeling that I had. This place that I called home was being completely littered by balloons and garbage left behind by tourists or maybe even locals. So kind of wanted to learn more about that and do something about it as well. So that's why I got involved with this nonprofit. Now, quick summary of what I'm talking about. We're gonna go over the problem, get a little sad. Um, ecological impacts, health impacts, plastics in the world, and then we're going to talk about the solutions. So things that you guys can do at home, um, in your school, in your communities that can make a huge change. So, so what's made of plastic? Think about right now, close your eyes, go into your bathroom, open a cabinet, what's made of plastic there? Shampoo bottles, toothbrush, uh, the cap on your toothpaste, uh, maybe you have those little cups to drink water after you're done. There's so much plastic around us. If we go into our kitchens, we have plastic forks, knives, straws, all these things that they used to not have. So back in the day, probably like your parents and grandparents, plastic wasn't a thing. So this is an article from Life Magazine in 1955. It was this introduction to what they call throwaway living. So people are coming back from the war, um, families want to spend more time together instead of doing dishes. How many of you guys actually enjoy doing dishes? No one? Okay, we're all on the same page there. So instead, they invented these great things where you can eat your meal and then throw everything away you don't want to put into the dishwasher. Sounds great if you don't like doing dishes, right? So they invented throwaway living. And it was advertised like that. You could throw everything away. All your troubles, all your worries, spend time with your family. Do things like that and it had a great connotation to it in the 1950s. But now we're starting to see where that away actually is. So this is a river in the Philippines. It used to be this booming fishing community until we saw that this became our away. This is where, if you notice, straws have filled this kid's boat. Instead of going fishing, because fish can't live in that, they do things like collect different types of plastics and they try to recycle them and they get money through that. So this is what our rivers look like. A little closer to home, how many of you guys have ever vacationed in Hawaii? We got one Hawaii, all right. Hawaii's beaches, there's areas that are being completely trashed where nesting birds used to hang out, but they can't anymore because they're young, are gonna get tangled up in plastic trash. This is where our way is. And then even closer to home, this is the LA River where we generate so much trash that when it rains and all that plastic gets carried into our water, they have to put across these giant booms that capture it and keep it from going out into our oceans. They pick up tons of trash so much that they have to bring in this giant crane to take it away. And this is just a rainstorm. So it could rain the next day and we still see this problem. 
So this is our away, and that's not proper. We have to find a way to stop that pollution from getting into the environment because it has a huge impact. So this is a model. Let's say we didn't have those booms in the LA River. Where would that go? So we see here, United States, Asia, Pacific Ocean. Can we all go with that? What I want you to do is imagine each of these little dots to be a plastic bottle that you threw into the ocean, off of Cali, and then you got someone off of Japan, throw the one too. So at zero years, this is where our bottles landed. In half a year, they start to move, and we see that kind of projected movement. Move a year later, they're about halfway, so our plastic bottle just hit Hawaii. And then three years, we start to see the things coming from Asia hitting the United States. 10 years, we start to see that our garbage and plastic pollution is ending up in this condensed area, and this is called the North Pacific Gyre. It's pretty much like a slurry of our waste that is stuck in this area here that's affecting everything around it, which is a concern. Sure, it's not in our backyard. I can't turn around and see the gyre, but it does affect some of the things that we love. So, there's huge ecological impact. So ecological, we're talking about birds and all the cool things like the seals that we just learned about, Chica. So one of the first things is invasive species. Kind of like the lowest key thing. We have here mussels. Mussels that came from Asia that floated across on trash to California. And then they're like, wow, California living? This is kind of nice. And they stuck around. Do you think that was good for the mussels in California though? No, so it has a huge invasive issue to it as well. And here's just some articles that cite that and support that. The other issue we see is entanglement. So this is a snapping turtle. Her name is Mae West. How many of you guys know of Mae West? No, I'll take that. Um, so Mae West has known for this like figure eight. And if you look at her, she kind of looks like a peanut because she got stuck in this nice little Gatorade, you know, on top of the Gatorade to have that little circle. She got stuck in there when she was little and continued to grow and grow and grow to the point where her organs now are either at the top or bottom and not in the middle. So entanglement is a huge issue that's not only turtles, but birds and marine mammals. And it's one of the biggest things that they're facing today. And then here's some published literature of that as well. And lastly, we have ingestion. So when it comes to plastic, it looks bright, it looks shiny, it looks colorful things that marine mammals and fishes want to eat. We're having whales and dolphins wash up with 20 plus plastic bags in their stomachs. This is a common death to them. Where whales used to be killed for hunting and keep them for blubber, and their population boomed once we stopped that, now the biggest thing that they're facing again is humans and the things that we can hurt them with. The other big issue that we see, especially with birds, is this is an albatross obviously died actually of emaciation. But how? Because its stomach was full. It's actually full of plastics. No nutritional value whatsoever. So you feel full, like Thanksgiving dinner, like really, really full. So you stop eating, right? They can't pass any of that. So they stop eating and get no nutrients whatsoever. And in turn, they die because they don't have that. And the worst part of albatross is they're feeding their young this. So a lot of baby birds are dying this from um, this as well, even though they're not eating it out of the ocean. And then here's some articles on that as well. So, how do plastics affect you? So maybe you don't care about fish or turtles or seals. You have no part in that side of the way, so I love seals. Um, they also affect you by just using them. So when it comes to plastics, they absorb and leach toxins. How many of you guys have heard never to drink a plastic water bottle that was left in like the car? Yeah, that's bad. We know that's bad because if you're leaving water in a plastic container in the car, all these chemicals are leached into it, pretty much. And then you're drinking those chemicals. And though it just looks like a fancy, you know, you guys in chemistry, bunch of designs here, a lot of them are things like BPA. How many of you guys look for BPA free, or your parents probably look for BPA free when you go buy? Yeah, it's one of the awful chemicals that we see released by different types of plastics. We also have marine debris being absorbed, DDT. Now, who's ever heard of DDT? Go ahead, Chica. Um, I know when people were putting in pesticides, mm -hmm. I think it was running off into the water and it would, when the birds would eat fish from that water, it would like destroy their eggs. Yeah, exactly. So DDT breaks down calcium 
And we haven't used it from like the 70s on because we realized it was a really bad idea, but we still find it in plastics out in our oceans because it's absorbed in there. And what do you think happens when something eats that plastic? It gets that DDT. And then what happens when we eat that something that ate that plastic? Right, we get sick. We get that buildup of that chemical that we don't want in our bodies. So, this kind of shows you how plastics change while they're at sea. It kind of looks like a pebble. Started off as a clear plastic, and then over time actually accumulates all those toxins to the point where it changes the plastic itself. And then here's some articles on that as well. So, fish ingest it. We know this. Fish, for a lot of us, are at the bottom of the entire food chain and build up from there. Now, one of my favorites. This is from a water sample out in the Pacific. What I want you to do is try to figure out there's two pieces of plastic on this water sample. Can you tell the difference between the plastic and the plankton that we see there? Then you got it? Keep it in your head. So those are the two pieces of plastic that we have of this water sample. Now, you guys are in a fairly well lit classroom. You've got pretty great vision to a fish at the deep darks of the Pacific Ocean. Think we can tell the difference? No, so that's how we're having a lot of this plastic accumulate in the food products that we eat, such as fish, or something that's fed with a fish even. So we see it as well as here. So we talked a little bit about these chemicals. One of the big things that they affect are your hormones. And for high schoolers, hormones are a big deal. You're going through a lot of stuff with hormones, and that's called your endocrine system. So these hormones are things that control your growth your development and all this kind of stuff are affected by these nasty chemicals that we would find in plastics and plastics leach. But we still do things like drink out of them, expose ourselves to them every single day. So just a few known things. So of those chemicals, we start to have detected them in newborns. So we're so used to using plastics and it's part of our life that these plastics are being found in newborn babies, even though they haven't ever touched plastic in their entire life which is kind of crazy. So we're gonna take a quick journey into these five gyres and to kind of check them out. So there's five of them. So this is pretty much the gyres, and if you think about it, these are high levels of plastic and different types of pollutants. So we're gonna travel into them a little further. So this is what the nonprofit that I worked for actually did. They took these giant boats out and they inventory how much plastic's out there. So here they hopped across the Indian Ocean gyre. So here you can tell it's kind of more plastics and pollutions there. And then they take this giant net and they trawl it, so they pull it behind the boat for about a mile. And this is what the Indian Ocean looks like. So we're getting coffee cups, and as well as things like fish, but we're also getting all these microplastics and other things along the way. Then we hop over to the South Pacific. So here's Easter Island. You can tell this giant patch of plastics here. And what they found when they took their boat through there um, it's pretty much, for those that like science, it's a perfect bell curve. So it shows that there's more trash in the middle there. 